Um, I'd like first of all to uh, really thank the organisers of a very inspiring workshop and also for truly trusting in the feasibility of interdisciplinary dialogue, which is a very rare thing in academia. We talk a lot about interdisciplinarity, but we very rarely achieve it. So, so really, thank you so much. Um, the reflection I would like to share with you today will obviously return to many questions and issues which have been raised since yesterday, specifically by Charles and Edwige yesterday, in relation to the politics of subjectivity. But those of you who were able to attend uh, the talk given by Valérie Loichaud in the February seminar, webinar, may also hear in my own talk presentation today some sort of a follow-up to Valérie's uh, uh, um, uh, reading, and specifically her reading of, the, uh, of what she defines as the art of the unritual, with, as you know, of course, her emphasis on the very complex delegation of symbolical power, and trusting to, I quote, Valérie, literary, poetic and aesthetic objects, the capacity to act as replacement tombs or cenotaphs. To anyone concerned with art's capacity to do justice to those existing on the outer margins of visibility and those whose death remains unrecorded, this delegation of symbolical power is one of the most aesthetically and politically complex ones. As I will try to show, such delegation does not only rethink art's heuristic capacity to see beyond, to unveil the invisible and thus achieve an aesthetic sublimation of loss and absence. The two exhibitions I will turn to in a first stage actually question the politics of such unveiling while, as you will see, trusting in art's capacity to think the politics of invisibility through. Art's symbolical and political task, when confronted with the breakdown of visibility, engineered by the denial of refugees' rights, is to make these bodies, these presences, visible again, and to defy invisibility itself by making us see even beyond absence itself. Now, obviously one might object that such heuristics is nothing new. And one might also rightly object that the necro politics at work in the current refugee or migrant crises far exceeds the modernist injunction to make us see. More pressingly to my mind, such necro politics tests art's capacity to occupy, that is what is precisely no site, what could be defined as a no site, but the site of a radical unmapping, whether of course we refer to the bodies lost at sea in unrecorded and uncharted or unchartable sinkings. We had a wonderful counterexample, of course, yesterday huh? in, in Charles Heller's uh, um, re reconstruction, uh, sort of remapping uh, of, these, of these deaths. So whether we refer to these uh, sea deaths or to the no rights zones of the refugee camps or detention centers. As I will try to show in a second stage, by turning briefly to the works of two artists, such unmapping puts art's cognitive potential to the test and calls for what might be defined as a fanatic phenomenology in which aesthetic experience comes unhinged. Needless to say, art's visuality offers a unique testing ground for the reclaiming of the visual dignity for those who have been expelled from the realm of the visible. The term visuality should be taken here in the acceptation given to it by Nicholas Mezoev in his essay, The Right to Look, a counter history of visuality. A term which for Mezoev encompasses the whole regime of historicity, regulating our access to the visible, our right to be seen and our right to look on and to look back. While aiming to bring to light and to cite the suppressed reality of migration, contemporary artists engage 
in a form of visual praxis, and the term came up yesterday, of course, huh? a visual practice, praxis that necessarily addresses the cultural economy at large. The episteme that regulates our reception of images and even more specifically, the criticity of our visual emotions. The exhibitions that have turned to migration in an attempt to elaborate a visual counter ethics have tied their redemptive and corrective agenda to a critical exploration of visuality. Now the first, so I'm going to share my screen now, uh, the first exhibition, Right. The first exhibition I like to turn to, um, an exhibition organized, co-organized in, in, in 20, uh, 18, 20, no, 19 by the National Museum for the History of Immigration and MacVal, one of the leading contemporary art centers of the Paris region, brought together works that for many of them address the challenge of thinking invisibility through. French artist Ben, for instance, tackled the issue of human rights violations head on in an installation that in the year of the bicentenary of the French Revolution, because the work uh, was, was produced uh, uh, much, much earlier, of course, to contemporary France to task for reneging on its original emancipatory ideals. And I thought it was, you know, worth pausing on that work, if only because of the, the presence of the bones, of course, huh? which somehow chimes so, so, so extraordinarily, you know, directly with, um, with, with the, the workshop. In other cases, the works harnessed physical experience to a political reflection on visuality. It was specifically the case with Julien Discret's installation as one entered the room, there was apparently nothing to be seen. But as you can see in the description of the works medium, invisible ink, UV light, presence detector sensors. Yeah. So as one walked into the room, yeah, one's presence automatically switched on the UV lights that revealed the statement, the writing on the wall written in invisible ink. So far from existing in two separate realities, the visible and the invisible are here literally shown to be co-extensive. One of the key devices of our surveillance society, the detectors, uh, the detection sens sensors, is used to show the visible and the invisible to exist in a dynamic experience of co-presence. Now, most of the works shown in Persona Grata had not initially responded to the refugee crisis. Their cooptation towards an understanding of our global politics of human rights denial was a way for the curators, a way of probing what might, after Judith Butler, when writing about war, be defined as the frames, the frames of such denial. And of course, Butler has come up, you know, repeatedly uh, in our workshop. I'm of course here referring uh, to what she defines as those frames, uh, as those visual and conceptual frames that are ways of building and destroying populations as objects of knowledge. And I mean, sitting on the term knowledge, objects of knowledge and targets of war that make certain lives ungrievable. Now, enlisting works that more broadly address the breakdown of justice and the process of political and social relegation is thus also, to still quote Butler, another solicitation to work through the frame, one that asks us to refuse the regulation of the censors that would accept the radical ungrievability of certain populations, or rather, the differential distribution of grievability upon which war depends." Unquote. And one might here substitute, of course, the necropolitics of migration denial for war. The recent exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Migration Through Contemporary Art, addressed the experience of ungrievability more frontally with works that upset what Butler defines as the regulation of the senses, upon which the frames of migration and their politics of representation depend. 
And one should mention at this stage that the opening of the show in Minneapolis was also the occasion for the US premiere of Ai Weiwei's Safe Passage. And Anna uh, uh, Christina Mendes will soon turn to another works by Ai Weiwei that engages, of course, huh, uh, with migration and uh, the, the denial of human rights. The works by, uh, Kat, by Kader Atia, for instance, and Mona Hatun, which I will turn later, featuring in the show, are here worth pausing for. In La Mer Morte, the Dead Sea, Kader Atia revisits a, a visual language that is well known now in contemporary art, a language already explored by the likes of Christian Bogtansky, for instance, in his memorializing of the Shoah. The scattered clothes in their variegated shades of blue produce a complex allegory of loss and mourning, both anonymous and implicitly preserving the absent present body that used to inhabit it. Each item reads like a mute cipher to be invested with a story that is both private and collective, both unique and generic. Of course, what is central here is the politics of narrativization, which we explored already yesterday. Our spontaneous desire to reinvest each piece of clothing with a specific body and narrative, a specific story, in spite of its obtuse silence, is deeply paradoxical and ambiguous. Imagining the stories behind these items of clothing may induce a form of mourning by proxy, as Carolina suggested yesterday, in relation to the migrants quarter in Catania's graveyard. But we may also wonder whether the genericity of the clothes, their anonymity, does not in fact deliberately reproduce the political relegation condemning the migrants perishing at sea to a sort of generic anonymity, in the same way as they are somehow simply sort of, you know, subdued under figures without truly being given back, granted back their rights, you know, as humans, as individuals. A complex dialectic is here at work in which presence and absence cannot be subsumed under a stable emotional trope. The abandoned clothes gesture towards stories that will never be documented, and yet, at the same time, they bear witness to lives that beg to be identified, but will remain nameless. In Mona Hatum's piece Exodus II, also present in the exhibition, the harnessing of metonymy and allegory to what might be defined as an aesthetics of the and yet, fosters an even more disturbing experience. Here, the cohabitation in her very strange insulation of the animate and the inanimate solicits our imagination and aesthetic experience in ways that preclude any dialectical closure. The hair once did belong to someone, now cut down to the minimal size of two sad and yet precious cardboard cases. And Hatum, as you may know, has repeatedly worked with human hair uh, in order to explore precisely uh, the denial of human rights, especially in the Palestinian uh, experience. The visual simile spins off in directions that cannot be charted. It imposes troubling associations linking the vision to other insistent images of genocides and crimes against humanity. The sentimental memento mori of the lock of hair with its associations with the power of love to transcend time and heal takes on a very uncanny dimension here. The memento mori is endowed with a far darker meaning. The preciousness of the trace is re-scripted as a spooky synecdoche for the instrumentalization and reification of mankind. Mona Hatum's Exodus II disturbs the phenomenology of aesthetic experience to re-embody the status of the refugee and disable visual satisfaction. So doing, 
The work also unsettles the frame of the museum and its ideological economy. The museum, the gallery, are exposed as part of the global vision and conceptual frames dictating to return to Butler, dictating, sorry, to, to return to Butler, because of course, uh, this is her reference to the frames, but also to the frames that uh, dictating who may live and who must die. And once again, of course, uh, I'm returning to Ashin Bembe's words. Words which, as you know, of course, uh, are directly borrowed from Foucault's exploration of war in his uh, Cour au Collège de France, and society must be defended. I just wanted to return you know, to that quote, that original quote by Foucault, huh, which reads uh, in his definition of sovereign power, you know, as the power having the ability to faire mourir ou laisser vivre, take life or let's die. The various translations of, um, of Foucault's words huh, also tell us something interesting about the way we process huh, the paradox. In the last stage of this paper, I would like to focus briefly on two works that also disturb the phenomenology of aesthetic experience in order to foreclose the very language of political empathy and return us to the bare reality of exile and migration, loss and relegation. So I'd like, I'd like to turn more specifically in this last stage to, to an issue which we have touched upon um, this morning, which is the issue of empathy and which Charles Heller turned to yesterday as well when he was wondering whether there wasn't something rather dubious about the way somehow we harness empathy, uh, humanist empathy, uh, to an attempt to make sense or process or mediate uh, the, 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 the sea death. The ironically titled Hope by French artist Adèle Abdesimed, very famous uh, work that really uh, caused an incredible reaction um, in, in, in the audience and in, in, in the part of critics, reinvests or disinvests the metonymic language of memorialization via what might be defined as a symbolical shortcut. The hope of those seeking a better life turns into death. The deathly irony is harnessed to a literal decoding of the global economy of oppression. Those who die unrecorded at sea are ungrievable, disposable lives. The bags can only be deciphered as both garbage bags and body bags in a visual shortcut that conflates genocide and ecocide, a correlation that Valérie Loichot explores in, in her essay, Watergraves, and which Lucinda turned to uh, yesterday. The process of literalization at stake here is meant to be repellent and to invalidate or foreclose any form of aesthetic satisfaction. The artistic sublimation generated by hope is ambiguous at best. The tradition of artistic shock fuels a confrontation with the suppressed truth of global discrimination. So doing, the gallery or museum experience is defamiliarized as being complicit in the frame of oppression. The lost and desecrated lives are granted a complex asylum within the walls of the art institution under the only garb granted to them as the opaque, disposable refuse of global capitalism. As already mentioned, the process of literalization is deliberately displeasing. It discards the solace of representation by opting for a literal equation. Those disposable lives are garbage lives. That makes, of course, vision at last accountable again. At stake, of course, is the very logic of representation and the necessity maybe to move beyond representation itself to account for the foreclosure of representation. In his essay, Return to the Postcolony, Spectres of Colonialism in Contemporary Art, and more recently still in his 2020 essay, Beyond the World's End, TJ Demos insists on the necessity to eschew the economy of representation. If art is to do justice to what is intrinsically a denial of representation. 
writing about John, the conference video installation for Vertigo C, Demos foregrounds the capacity of a conference cinema to, I quote Demos, manifest a protest against finitude, as well as against the idea that representation can totalize experience and colonize significance, as if the image can ever become complete or self-sufficient, unquote. One may rightly object here that Abdesimed's visual shortcut still pertains to the economy of representation. It aims at exposing, yet the shortcut affords no sublimation or visual solace, but forces us to an encounter that is in no way reparative. The last work I would like to turn to briefly does not opt for the shock of the literal, it nevertheless upsets the very phenomenology of aesthetic contemplation and works also against representation. The work I would like to turn to by Chilean artist Enrique Ramirez, a work I have to thank Judith and her partner Amy Barak for drawing my attention to, was part of Ramirez's installation Les Incertains, showed in the Pompidou Center as part of the run-up to the 2020 Prix Marcel Duchamp. The installation consists of photographs and videos, all reworking what has been one of Ramirez's key inspirations, the sea, its power of endless fascination and deathly indifference to man's yearning to embrace a brighter future. In the Pompidou Center installation, one of the videos featured what can only be initially deciphered as a body gently bobbing face down in the calm sea. And I, and I apologize, I couldn't find a, an image that really you know, does justice to, uh, to the installation. But the image soon provokes a sort of visual double take as one realizes that there probably is more than meets the eye. And even that double take is already a pointer to the logic of the video. Is our eye so jaded? so used to images of floating bodies, so framed in Butler's meaning of the term, that the body can only be a dead body, floating without anyone paying attention to it. But that body, of course, requires proper visual attention. The body is shot from a low angle shot. We are suspended underneath it, looking up to it and the sun shining through water. But the sequence shot is far too long. No one can remain so long in water without actually dying. So yes, that image deserves we pay proper attention to what it triggers in us and how it truly works. The device, obviously, you will, you will have understood by now, is both simple and dizzying. Ramirez has simply shot the man floating and upended the footage. Implementing such upending is no doubt technically very, very arduous and difficult to achieve. But the final effect is mesmerizing and thought provoking. Our phenomenological interaction with the image is profoundly disturbed. A form of cognitive dissonance results that requires awful consideration. In turn, our visual attention becomes itself disturbing. What are we doing here at the heart of the cultural apparatus, in this instance, the Pompidou Center, relishing in the vision of a black body floating at sea? The cognitive dissonance induces a meta-aesthetic chain reaction. The vision is both immersive and repellent. And the care we take trying to make sense of what we see echoes negatively with the little time our world has for dead bodies, usually not so gently bobbing at the surface of the sea. The phenomenology sustaining our aesthetic experience becomes here intimately political. It speaks, it speaks back to us in an inchoate and obscure way of our failures of attention. It requires, rather than begs, our attention and speaks for all the bodies left unattended, voiceless to sink at sea. It refuses, and as an image, it refuses to sink and be engulfed. As such, it objects visually, phenomenologically, cognitively, and thus perturbs and resists the logic of representation. 
All the works discussed here, and I'm drawing to my conclusion, engage in a re-embodied dialogue with loss and death. Their thematic ethics lies in their capacity to harness our empirical and phenomenological response to a work of conjuring. If art is to do justice to the absent bodies of migrants lost at sea or expelled from the realm of citizenry, it must do so by implicating the bodies of the spectators. The shocking, displeasing, destabilizing experience allows the frames of visualization to be reflected in our gaze. A gaze that can be neither neutral nor indifferent, a gaze that is held to account and in which sensation becomes at last fully political. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Bidisha, and I'm very happy to be part of this um, uh, wonderful and rich uh, panel. Uh, I believe that um, the works uh, I will present uh, will also resonate with other, um, with other papers uh, yesterday and, and today. So I'm going to um, share my screen. Um, can you see it? Can you see the screen? Not yet. It, okay, yes, now we can. Yes. No, it is okay. All right. Do you want to go to okay. the screen? Is it, is it okay like this? Do you see um, it? It, I don't see the, uh, the pictures. I don't see the images anymore. Screen. Um, if you just click that thing, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so over the past two decades, graphic literature uh, has been substantially diversifying and now occupies numerous symbolic locations, both within the artistic field and other areas of rep representation and social discourse. The generic opening and hybrid formats have contributed to increased legitimization and visibility of the medium and autobiographical, testimonial and non-fictional graphic storytelling have been playing a notable role here. These formats and modes have indeed become particularly fertile in addressing complex political and social is issues such as war, displacement and migration. It should be said that the notions of dislocation, the transnational and migration have been accompanying the graphic literature uh, from its very beginning, be it thematically or because of the migratory experience of many of its creators. While this concerns classic figures of the graphic pantheon, and while the 80s have opened perspectives with authors investing migration and born new topics, it is since the turn of the century, nourished by memorial and post-colonial perspectives in the arts and society, that migration has become more and more visible in graphic literature, with key figures such as Marjan Satrapi, Zeyna Abirached, and Riyad Satouf bringing the topic to more mainstream audiences. Besides, graphic subgenres like reportage, inaugurated in the 90s by Joe Sacco and larger travel writing, have flourished with magazines like Courrier International and specialized journals like La Revue des Ciné or 21, but also Beaux-Arts magazine, publishing issues on political graphic narratives and migration. In 2013, a major graphic, liter lit graphic literature exhibition in Paris was dedicated to migration. And this was before the European migrant crisis, no need to say, that creation in the field has intensified since then with ONGs and other actors from civil society supporting the graphic narratives on the issues. In short, one can say that migration has achieved today a certain visibility within graphic literature and it is increasingly reaching out to non-specialist audiences. Yet these newly engaged productions touch on several complex, partly interrelated issues. On the one hand, lingers the reduction to the solely illustrative on the other, the suspicion of simplification and superficiality, which cannot be easily dismissed when graphic texts become simple pretexts for extra textual matter, identity, politics, society, and so on. At the same time, certain forms of fictionalization and aesthetic play may meet with ethical reservations for issues which seem to rather call for serious and factual attention. And of course, Discursive and visual expression entertain a multiple relationship where one may compensate for, duplicate and reinforce or contrast the other. This paper is informed by such interrogations about the specificity of a polysemic medium and the intricacy of its new engaged formats. 
and will provide a brief investigation into the graphic work on migration and displacement of several contemporary French authors. It will focus on a specific question of how death of migrants and refugees is represented and reflected in these narratives. And I would like to show with selected excerpts in these creations that writing about such delicate topics does neither have the same scenographical implication nor trigger the same sensitive and critical responses as drawing them. And this will demonstrate that the principal aesthetic and political relevance of these works lies in the medium's characteristic interplay between the two modes of representation, the graphic and the textual. Now, let me start with Jean-Philippe Stassen's 30-page story entitled The Visitors of Gibraltar, which initially appeared in 27, and which is dedicated to migratory trajectories between Northern Africa and Spain. The author's documentary approach is indeed quite distinctive here. He offers quick zooms on different locations and people he meets. And while he is only rarely visually present on the panels, his enunciative presence is very strong, mostly in short introductory texts to the subplots, which take place in different cities in Spain, Morocco, Gibraltar, and Belgium. This discourse, which mixes anecdote and triviality with historical fact and social commentary, has often ironic and polemical undertones, uses ambiguity and ellipsis. And it is frequently informed by his stylized semi-realist images, which, rather than simply accompanying or illustrating the text, constitute dissonant signifiers, fragmentary reflections, or distorting lenses. And although Stassen has written on many violent issues and zones struck by war and genocide, he rarely provides explicit or shocking images. So how is migrant death represented in this story? First, the thematic frame is set with the author's caustic comment about different types of migrant boats arriving from, quote, full of living people, others full of dead people, others simply empty, unquote. This is followed by a short passage focusing on an elderly Spanish lady flowering a tomb in memory of the deceased migrants. It's an echo to the memorial in Catania and Carolina's presentation yesterday, this idea of a grief by proxy. And in spite of this memorial presence and the commemorative gesture, the site indistinguishably refers to the deceased migrants as a group in contrast to the individual tombs shown on the panel below. Migrant death clearly remains a collective issue. Besides, on the next panels, the elderly lady and her friend designate themselves as, quote, antique carcasses, who are the only ones left to honor the dead. The last Moicans amongst the crowds of teeth bleached kite surfing tourists, tourism again. Put differently, the author implies that the question of assuming responsibility through this by proxy grieving remains a marginal gesture. Here, as elsewhere, Stassen thus puts in relation various contrasting or complementary signifiers which resonate and possibly collide. Finally, the zoom out at the end of the sequence allows another such aesthetic and ultimately political echo. Indeed, the colorful kites of the surface seem from afar uh, do uncannily evoke the tiny flowers on the tomb on the previous page. One sea of icons thus resonates with another. In the same maritime and coastal space, the enthusiastically and unconsciously living versus the tragically deceased the top and literary bottom side of our neoliberal capitalist spectrum. In Stassen's general project of letting various semantic and semiotic elements dialogue to comment on the migratory phenomena in the long durée and the macro space, there are other subtle phonetic occurrences. But migrant death does not lead to explicit representations and reflections in the visitors of Gibraltar. It stages it as a spectral presence hovering over the precarious individuals and their uncertain and often tragically ironic fate. And death is finally brought up twice at the end of the narrative. Firstly, when the author tells an African migrant on the Spanish-French border the story of Walter Benjamin, who committed suicide when he was refused entry to Spain while fleeing the Nazis in 1940, and who was buried in a mass grave. Second, the story closes on an exchange in a bar in Belgium when one Algerian character speaks of his desire of repatriating his deceased father, father to Africa. 
both passages inscribed a thematic motive within migratory configurations in a larger historical and geographical frame and raise again political awareness through juxtaposition and analogy. The first by creating echoes between contemporary migratory dramas and the refugee tragedies during World War II. The second to suggest that death in diaspora remains a crucial symbolic and material marker of identity and belonging. To claim, but not without its counter argument because the family on the, of the Moroccan character is buried in Belgium that beyond the seemingly successful integration into a host society for decades, the homeland maintains a singularly existential cultural and religious attraction. In Stassen's more mosaic narrative, the thematic motive is therefore part of a scenographical strategy which mobilizes the text image interplay by use of ellipsis, evocation, and a contrapuntal to trigger a sensitive, but especially a critical response to the complex migratory subject. Let me move on to Humans, The Roya is a River by Edmond Baudouin and Troops, a graphic investigation into the trajectories of African migrants crossing from Italy to France on a Mediterranean border. It is a book of full of encounters and political reflections with an openly subjective testimonial and dialogical aspect, and with the two authors being very present in discourse and image. And the cover pictures instantly show the suggestive and opaque, but also dialogical element of their approach. On the right, the hardly recognizable faces sculpted in the mountains appear like phantoms of dead migrants in an avalanche of somberness. The two birds hovering above the crevice like vultures. Besides, the color provides relief and visual clarity while adding a dramatic component. The shadow cast by the trees on the slope resembling the smoke of a wildfire, the whole landscape as if soaked in blood with a white lake, almost a blinding abyss. And this is echoed by the back cover on the left, which shows scattered clothes abandoned by the migrants before passing the frontiers. Again, scattered clothes. As we will hear later on, this is a way of shedding their skin, of transforming themselves. What becomes instantly apparent with these covers in sole visual terms are the album's discrete motives of death as a haunting presence as organically inscribed in a very soil and also of the trace, the mark of human passage, ephemeral hiding places for precarious bodies, fragile remnants and scars and invasive and or hidden bodies which echo with the fragmentary and expressive graphics. The narrative then opens media scenarios with existential migratory issues and the question of migrant death as potential risk, lift or witnessed experience are suggested and implied in symbolic indirect manner. On the second page, we instantly find a significant self-reference to Baudouin's album Mediterranean. And in this illustrated book for young audiences about the migrant crisis, the artist contrasts the beauty of the sea and the horror of the drowned migrants focusing on a girl who has died during the sea journey. And this recalls visually the opening in Armin Greda's The Mediterranean discussed by Lucinda yesterday. Reminiscent of the tragically iconic image of the drowned Syrian boy, Alan Khoury, again, which made global headlines, this is an illustration of rare explicitness and transparency for Baudouin's scenography. For he works indeed predominantly in black and white, with often blurred, fragmented, of or partial figuration and illusion, precisely because on this panel or on the opening page, where Baudouin places the migrant body permanently navigating between re resilience or endurance and death or disappearance. This is not only a body with geopolit within geopolitical logics, but dramatic, telluric, and aquatic forces. From the opening pages, the migrants are identified as tiny figures caught between giant nat natural hazards a mix of tsunami waves, volcanic eruptions, and whirlwinds, which do frame, uh, which no frame seems able to contain. Beyond this first graphic occurrence hinting at drowning migrants, death is then mentioned when the authors go uh, to a precipice on a mountain called the Step of Death, notorious for fatal accidents. 
Other than the scattered objects which feature, again, an unsettling indicator of human passage, we find in the drawing one of the many characteristic lines of horizons, which introduces a key passage of critical reflection, condensing the artist's project and location. Beautiful nature versus dramatic human fate, urgent political and humanitarian matter in a place whose civilization goes back 5,000 years. The illustrator's activity both as a committed testimonial and an act of sharing, but also a solitary refuge, drawing manifested as, quote, a pleasure, with a barbed border fence behind his back and drowning people in a sea beyond the cliff. While this comment about drowning people in relation to the beautiful sea horizon becomes highly evocative for many other seaward horizons drawn in the book, the sequence, re sequence reveals first and foremost the physical and symbolical location of the involved actors. Put differently, the artist is a witness within and open to the world, but also, at least momentarily, turning their back on it, loosening himself, losing himself in a timelessness of the creative gesture. The explicit comment of stopping time powerfully manifests in these silent images. In this passage and its manifest autoreferentiality, the medium and genre themselves and the dual testimonial approach chosen by the authors become intricate interplay of viewpoints in a literal sense of, of, of observing each other and of investing the other's gaze. For humans is above all a story of gazes and faces of the vitality and individuality suggested in particular by the portraits, which are the visual leitmotif of the album, humanizing and giving vigor to the migrants, to the migrants alive, obviously. On the one hand, no doubt that death runs through the book like a thin red line. It is witnessed in the liberating speech of the migrants, like with an Ivorian character who tells about exploitation and, ab uh, and abuse in Libya, testifying to, quote, the routine of living with corpses every day, unquote. It is graphically reconstructed, like in Baudouin's almost abstract representation of a drowning migrant, focusing on the hardly visible last, quote, vision of the eyes going towards the abyss, unquote. A look, a look which seems unerasable for, survive, for, for the surviving boat companion and by proxy for the author himself, even in death humanity finds its quintessential expression in the gaze. And this also concerns the book's symbolic figurations where giant skeleton-like fetishes emerge from the sea and stare at the author and us in whose gaze the Mediterranean has transformed into a cemetery. On the other hand, despite this plural fanatic presence in humans, life is asserted over death precisely by the act of figuration and visual portrayal. This right to look mentioned just before by um, Catherine. This dialogic act of representation which shows the vital faces of the migrants becomes a symbolic means against the death they have escaped. And if the portrayal is an act of humanizing, the book's title is fully realized when the migrants themselves attempt to draw the artists. In these moments, quote, life gets indeed the upper hand against, quote, the thoughts of death and death which accompany the refugees. And also against the mortal beauty of the mountains, which may unveil corpses in spring after the snow melt. But while humans focus on those migrant characters with death behind them and possible death ahead, death is more often reflected on than represented in graphic terms. The fanatic motive does not occupy a demonstrative visual space, but become a spectral presence throughout the 100-page narrative, nourished by the expressionist brushstrokes with frequently sparked the imagination. It locates the migrant body in a multifaceted, iconic, and discursive web of significations, like on the book's last double page, and this is on the bottom of the slide, where we see on the one hand, the two authors in the liminal space, and on the other, the discrete elevation of a drowned migrant from the turbulent sea. Whatever the real violence of anonymous death and the real loss of the trace on the migrant journey, this final elevation in all its sensitivity and human fragility operates as a potent metaphor of the artistic work uh, as a symbolic act of ethical restitution 
of visualizing, restoring dignity and claiming the right of the imagination against the geopolitical predicaments of our time. Let me finally briefly reflect on the experimental work of graphic artist Ivan Alakbe, whose intense and often disturbing narratives provide an intricate mix of the contemporary and of the mythological. While migration and death are both relatively present in Alakbe's oeuvre, migrant death is not represented explicitly. We do see characters dying in quite drastic images, for example, in the collection Yellow Negroes and other imaginary creatures, where the arrest of one illegal immigrant is juxtaposed with a suicide of another character. Besides, death's lingering presence is materialized through several metaphorical crosses um, scattered all over the storylines. In other terms, death has a latent potentiality and is a permanent threat to the characters who struggle at the fringes of society. Concerning more specifically migrant death in Alakbe's work, one needs to take a closer look at recent complements to his collection, and it's very significant that it's actually recent complements to this 2011 collection. For example, one sees a striking graphic addition to the yellow inside covers, which feature a collage of several loosely interrelated elements. The page with the pedestrian crossing in a Parisian suburb on the bottom and the big gallon-like ship on the top are significantly complemented with a coastline and another reenactment of the drowned Syrian boy, Alan Kurdi. This is a very daunting political statement where geographies and temporalities are juxtaposed and suggestively related. Without any comment, these images converge uh, to a general statement against past and present colonialist and capitalist exploitation. An even more complex appears his short story, Sand Niggers, a personal and metafictional reflection on various issues of identity, accompanying a most diverse graphic composition, including redrawn family photographs, mythological appearances and images of Donald Trump next to Klansmen like figures. And in this flux of signifiers, contemporary migration has a central role. The author mentions the notorious discourse about, quote, the misery of the world and, quote, the nigger on the beach whose world becomes inhabitable, inhabitable once again, unquote, while creating critical associations and analogies. On the one hand, he links the current migration crisis to the demonic tales of graphic artist Aristophan, bridging the gap between mythology and the presence with the troubling images of the sinners received in Inferno committing, uh, commenting on a terminal lived by the refugees. On the other, he parallels the massacre of the Algerian throne into the Seine in October 61 with a redrawn picture of a capsizing migrant boat hung on the banks of the Seine in 2017 by French artist Pierre de la Vie. Eventually, he locates his own ambivalent position as one between the phantoms of the living. He writes, I quote, I live with a death, uh, with the moors, with the blacks, the mad. My friends, the Negroes at the bottom of the ocean, deep in the sand and in, in the sands and streams of El Dorados, I dwell with the living, unquote. At the same time, the existential interrogative remains until the end, when he wonders whether his, quote, love can hold all the woes of the world, while resorting back to mythology a mirthless giant siren floating on an empty boat, thus leaving historicity and avenging into the unfathomable death of a personal and uh, the intimate. So in conclusion, what I want you to demonstrate and reflect on with these examples is that while explicit uh, or literal or shocking representations of the dead or dying migrants seem relatively rare in graphic literature, the fanatic motive is omnipresent in these works on migration. It operates by way of ellipsis, illusions, and evocation. It is part of a graphic play of contiguity and concealment. It has a more or less visually identifiable spectral presence, or it is located in larger semantic and iconic fields of signification. And while the authors have put in place various subtle and indirect visual devices which stimulate the imagination, they provide complementary or dissonant discursive elements in order to allow 
in this text's interconnectedness are both sensitive and critical reception of the migratory issue. All these narratives are part of not only the post-colonial turn in graphic narration, but of larger ethical tendencies in literature with the increasing presence of books contributing to quote, to repair the world, to refer to Alexandra Geffen's notion and which broaden the very idea of literature itself. Some of these works may acquire particular value because they reflect um, factuality or even lived and witnessed reality. However, these narratives clearly signify beyond their documentary, informational, and testimonial components. They provide highly subjective mise en scène, composite articulations of various discursive and narrative strategies, which certainly prompt our reflection, but even more so call upon our emotions and sensitivities. Indeed, if there is any specific value to be foregrounded here, it seems to me after all that the critical and hermeneutic and phenomenological uh, quality of these works lies first and foremost in their aesthetic dimensions. But this is of course an aesthetics, which in particular for a sensitive issue like migrant death and to speak in Edward Said's terms, cannot be dissociated from ethics. It is in this very sense that the, these authors of graphic literature are operating on a sensitive fault line where the tragedy of drowning people does not exclude the pleasure of drawing. The social urgency and the political do not banish the enchantment of art, but on the contrary, call out for the creative gesture as an agent of humanization and of transformation. Thank you for your attention.